Hey, hey, it's TDA and welcome back to this masterclass on Dice Sphere program. And if you've been playing along by now, you should have a mall that is basically making every single battling in the game. And there's just one thing missing, and that is an actual Dyson Sphere. Because, of course, this game is called Dyson Sphere program. And if we look at our sun, where is it? Where is it? Somewhere on the other side of the planet, of course. Well, anyway, you would see that there is no Dyson Sphere around it. As you can see, nice and shiny, but yeah, no power from a Dyson Sphere. So we're going to fix that. But in order to fix that, we actually have to do a bit of groundwork in order for that to actually work. First of all, let's talk about power, because it's actually not that efficient at this point anymore to keep powering your planets with solar panels. The, and there was actually a lot of people asking me in the comments why I was still using them. The simple reason for that is that we didn't really have the infrastructure in place to use anything else. We definitely do not want to use wind energy and then solar energy was the next best thing. However, placing these solar panels all around your new planets is not only tedious, it's also going to be a huge strain on resources, which is not the biggest consideration. But all in all, it's just not the best way forward, it's not the most efficient way forward. A different option that I actually used to employ quite a lot is using energy exchange because you will have excess energy on some of your planets by now, uh, especially I think on this planet as well. Let's just check that out. Yeah, you can see we have about 700 megawatts of spare energy because I overbuilt those solar panels. Um, but I don't like to rely on these exchangers too much because it always somehow breaks down. Um, because there's a spike in demand somewhere or you are not producing enough of these accumulators or whatever and they're quite annoying to set up. So you can use them, they definitely work and they're actually quite efficient uh, once you have them set up, uh, but it's just not the way I suggest that you do it. Instead, at this point, I suggest you start mass producing deuteron rods. These are made from deuterium and um, we also need some super magnetic rings as well as alloys but honestly if you look at the recipe itself it's mainly the deuterium that's going in these rods and you actually get two rods out of one cycle of the recipe and we have an infinite amount of deuterium now because we have that gas giant up and running so this is a really cheap recipe it's really um it's a relatively slow recipe but compared to how long you will actually be able to use these rods um, it's actually very very efficient so start producing that and let's check out how we set up our mining planets now if you're anything like me then your typical mining planet will probably look something like this a couple of these rings of solar panel because rings are efficient if you use solar panels some uh, miners spread all over the place with some a random um, ILSs to actually take in these resources and export them outward with some belts all over the place, etc, etc. Now, there's nothing particularly wrong with this. Um, but again, placing all these solar panels is really annoying. You need a lot of them. You need to ship them in. Water gets in the way. Um, making these rings is really annoying. So, in other words, um, it's just tedious. I have a better way for you. I present to you the Mining Planet Blueprint. This is for lazy people like me. And lazy is pretty much the same as wanting to be effective, so that actually works quite well. What we have over here is an ILS in the middle, requesting all the mining related uh, buildings, pumps, etc. We have one over here that is uh, requiring all the vessels that we need to transport the stuff. And in the back over here we have um, some film requesting the fusion power plants as well as ILS. I've set that to zero by default just to make sure you don't draw it when you don't need them. Uh, power poles as well as proliferators and fuel rods. And those fuel rods will then spread out and go into these fusion plants that will supply you with over 600 megawatts even without proliferation. And that is quite enough to basically fuel whatever you need on the average mining planet. Now the other ILSs over here are all requesting different resources. There's actually uh, duplicates of every single version of them. So basically all the resources that you can get in the entire universe are in here, the raw resources at least, and uh, they're in here twice. So you just plop this down, start mining everything, and it should be 
export it off planet depending on how you actually get it to the ILS. You can use PLSs for that. You can use ILSs for that. It's kind of doubling up. Just make sure that you have all the resources going out that you need without really having to bother about, especially everything that goes into a advanced mining machine will automatically be drawn from it with the bots that are, oh, sorry, the drones that are going in here and then transported to the ILS and if you feel like you need more outgoing ILSs of the same type, you can just repurpose some of these ILSs that we have over here because you're not going to have, for example, asset on every single planet. So if you need more, let's say, iron ore being exported off planet, you just replace this. But by default, you have already everything set up. So you only need to kind of fiddle around depending on what you actually have on a single planet. There is one little trick to actually get this to work though, because as you can see, even though I have all the fuel and all the power plants here, they're not working because the sorters are not putting it into the power plant. In order to solve that, all we need to do is just put in a couple manually, and you actually need a fair bit of those, but you should have enough uh, because you're transporting it to the planet. And so I think it's about three that you need to supply before it actually completely powers itself. Well, actually it's four, but as you can see, once you have four up and running, that is enough power to make sure everything else is up and running as well. And everything takes care of itself. However useful as that little hub is, actually I think the most important part about this blueprint is the power grid that I have set up all around the planet. That you can just put down with one click. And then wherever you go, you can basically just say, oh, hey, here is some fire ice. I want to mine this. Well, I'll just put down a mining machine, maybe something like this. And I'll plop a power pole next to it. And it's good to go. That's it. It's now uh, exporting, importing, etc. And you don't need to worry about anything else. No uh, spreading around power poles all across the planet, fiddling around with that or anything like that. All you need to do is put down a couple of power plants and there you go there you uh, have um, in this case some titanium ore being exported and this makes it really really quick and easy to set up most of this if you are pumping something out of a planet so let's say uh, water or um, acid all you need to do is basically set down an ILS or a PLS and connect the pumps to that. You still need to do that manually, but you, honestly, you don't need to do that that many times. It's mostly the ores that is usually what burns people out because you have to place so many of those miners. Speaking of miners, I could almost hear some of you screaming at me when I place down this miner over here, like, oh, you're missing a few nodes. Those are going to go to waste. And well, you were right, but you can easily fix that with a small miner like this. Uh, remember, there's a lot of belt inputs for an advanced mining machine, so you can just put it in and it will be exported off uh, if you're really worried about wasting some of these nodes. Now, honestly, there are so many resources in the game that I would recommend just placing these down on as many nodes as you can and then just move on to the next node. But if you want to take every single little node on the planet, then this is a very efficient way to do so. Now, if you are an older player like I am, as in having played this game for a longer time, you might be thinking, but TDA, this is not going to work because there's going to be all kinds of stuff in the way, maybe oceans, maybe uh, whatever, lava, um, things that will not allow me to put down my blueprint. However, I took that into account. So once you start placing your blueprint, you'll probably get some sort of warning like this, either foundations or things getting into the way. However, if you press shift enter, and I know it says right there on the tooltip, but it's easy to overlook. But if you press shift enter, it will force down the blueprint and just ignore the parts that you couldn't put down. And as you can see, that just builds whatever it can. And the nice thing about this grid is that if there's a couple of pieces missing, that's actually not a big deal because there is the grid is coming from multiple directions. So unless like three or four specific pieces get broken, your grid will still work like you want it to. Now, I do want to note that the exception to that is the uh, hub on the pole, because if this is not working, then, then nothing on this planet will be working. So just make sure you clear this little tiny area on one of the poles, or maybe you don't even have to clear it, like I haven't actually had to clear this planet's uh, poles. Uh, just make sure that you can actually put this down and clear it out if you can't. So at this point, I'll assume you have all the resources you need, including unipolar magnets so you can make the planar smelters. They're very useful to have at this stage in the game. 
Um, it's the only thing you're going to be using the, the unipolar magnets for, at least that's the only thing I recommend you use them for. And don't worry, they're never going to run out, even though you will only find these around black holes and neutron stars, because there's no way you're going to make enough of these planar smelters in order for you to actually go through those millions that you will still have. Now, I actually recommend making your rockets and solar sills in the same system where you're actually going to be building your Dyson Sphere. And for that purpose, I am going to repurpose our uh, lava planet, where we were just mining some titanium and uh, silicon, and make this into our production planet for the Dyson Sphere. And it also means I'm going to be building the Dyson Sphere around our starting sun. Now, our starting sun only has a luminosity of one, so you might argue that this is not the best sun to build a Dyson Sphere around. However, I'm going to do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's convenient having all our production planets in the same system. Uh, it's also very centrally located, so that makes bringing in those resources a lot more convenient. And because we are going to be making our science on one of these planets, it also helps to actually have the missing part for our white science in the same system as well. It just keeps the transport lanes a lot more efficient. Now, the counter argument to this is that because this has a fairly low luminosity, it would be more efficient in a way to build your um, Dyson Sphere around an O-type planet, uh, O-type star I mean, assuming I can find one. This is all the B-types, it's blue as well, but apparently I suck at finding them. There we go. So an O-type star usually has a lot higher luminosity, which basically means it's a multiplier on the output of your Dyson Sphere. So if I would be building my Dyson Sphere around this sun, it would be producing about two and a half times as much energy um, and output than when I'm building it here. The problem with that is that this O-type star is all the way at the edge of my galaxy and we have a couple of others, but as you can see, they're all at the edge, which just means it's inconvenient to get there. There's a long transport lane. It's not necessarily something you can't overcome. You can just build a couple of mining planets there, etc., etc. But all in all, I just prefer my first Dyson Sphere to actually be in my starting system. But you do you. It's completely up to you where you place your first Dyson Sphere yourself. Now, because we're going to be producing a lot of things on this planet, I once again need to kind of redesign how this planet looks. And I actually cleared out every single facility on this planet. There weren't that many to begin with because we're just mining a couple of basic things over here. Uh, a lot of those things are actually outdated as well because we just have the basic miners and stuff like that. But anyway, if you want to follow along, just clear out the planet first and then move on with the next exciting part. Which is the new and improved receiving mall or supply mall or whatever you want to call it. Demand mall, I think I call it in the blueprints. Um, basically, this is the final version or almost the final version because you can actually upgrade a little bit further if you want. Um, of our mall that is going to supply us with every single building in the game. Now, again, because of this location, it's going to be very efficient to actually get these buildings because the supplying mall is almost next door. Uh, and of course, rather than our previous version, our starting version of this mall, I now don't have the solar panels in here anymore. But again, the fusion power plants, which are going to supply us with a pretty hefty amount of energy to begin with. And of course, on top of that, I now have a, a complete grid. Uh, apparently, there's a little part of the grid missing, but at least there should be a grid uh, in the blueprint for your power purposes so you can just start building right away and you don't have to manually figure out where the power is going to go. Um, of course again just make sure you shift enter if the blueprint has any obstructions like for example this lava over here that's why this pole is missing but all in all um, there's enough redundancy in the grid to make sure the power should be getting everywhere even if there's some things getting in the way. The grid also helps me kind of figure out where I need to place my building. So I'll just kind of stick in the corner of one of the grid sections. And we are going to start with some of the basic materials. Now I'm just showing you this graphite layout with the total of 22 graphite smelters. Because I actually think we can make the layouts a little bit more neat by tucking in these distributors in the corner like we haven't done so over here. So make it even more square um, than we did before. Now, when you're making a larger build, again, you just remember to start at the edge of a section of the map, preferably the inner section around the equator, because that gives you a lot of space to build and it will avoid your blueprints getting messed up by these, uh, these lines that you don't want to cross, as well as, of course, the layout, because this jumping grid will make a mess out of it. Now, we are also going to be using a slightly different way to make the build even neater in terms of where we place the logistic distributors, because as 
as you can see, I just tucked them in the corner. So we'll have a starting layout of 22 graphite smelters. And then we have these two nicely tucked in the corner, each uh, taking the inputs from one single belt. Um, this one doubling up just because we can. And I think this just makes it look, look even more neat than we already were doing before. Now I'm actually aiming for a build that's going to produce one rocket per second and then on top of that two solar sails per second. And I mean on top way because we also actually need the solar sails to make the rockets. But um, we want a bit of each and we need quite a bit of solar sails in order to fill out the, the actual sphere. But in the end the rockets are the bottleneck typically for your output. So you need a lot of both. That's basically what I'm trying to say. And keeping it at these ratios of 1 to 2, especially the rockets is what's going to be the most... Um, consuming part of this build just keeping it small makes it easier to scale it up as you need as you uh, expand and build upon this and just keeps the build manageable now in order to make that we actually already need quite a bit of materials so we have a total of 16 uh, is this 16 yes it is 16 silicon smelters we need a slightly fewer titan uh, ore smelters and then we need some iron as well uh, we also need magnets and as you can see we can actually use the same input belt to make both the iron and the magnets so that's just a little uh, smart trick we are using over here and we're also going to need a small amount of copper as well as glass smelting and that covers all the basic materials now I recommend hooking this facility up to resources straight away because this, that way you can already start producing it and it will balance it out faster as you're building it. And um, you might also notice that I just relocated the glass just to tuck it in in this corner over here, just make it a little bit more compact and almost exactly squared to cover all our base resources. We don't forget to actually proliferate everything because otherwise the ratios will be off. And um, I'm actually bringing in proliferators over here with a lot of basic resources, but I'm also bringing in the warpers over here and then supplying the second ILS with the warpers from this one. Now we actually have some space in here that we'll be using in a moment because of course we do need more raw resources, but for now that means we have everything going. Now wrapping up everything that we need to produce with smelters just to keep them neat and organized in the same corner are the titanium alloy as well as the steel production. And, and once again, I took these in uh, in a corner together so we keep it all nice and square and keep in mind that if you were not using planar smelters you would actually need to double up on this so you can see how much um, inputs are going to go into a very simple build that's only going to produce one rocket per second and two solar sails um, something else to note here is that we once again are using these boxes but I'm also using the acid as a raw resource from now on because there's planets with acid lakes on them which give you an infinite amount of acid and there's really no reason to produce these with um, chemical plants from this point on so I'm also going to assume you found a planet with this on it and you put down some pumps there Moving on to the assembler part of our build, I recommend starting out with something that takes a lot of these so you kind of know how much room you need to work with. And in this case, I started out with the components because we need 11 Mark III assemblers making those. And again, Mark III assemblers are awesome because you just need so many um, fewer of those than you would need with the Mark I and the Mark II. I'm also, of course, bringing in the proliferators, and I don't think I mentioned that, but I have these two proliferator distributors over here that are drawing from the belt before they actually go into the raw resource. And the reason I'm doing that is that it's more important, if I ever run out of proliferators, it's more important that they reach the, the last stages of the production than it is that they need the earlier ones, just because everything else that's further down the chain is more valuable. Now, of course, the build won't actually function if you're not proliferating everything, but at least when I'm running low, I prioritize the stuff that matters the most. As a side note, if you haven't done so yet, I recommend that you research all the Dyson Sphere stress system upgrades so you can actually make a pretty nice looking Dyson Sphere and start working on the upgrades for the solar sail live as well as the ray transmission its efficiency. All of that will be useful in a moment from now. I'm going to try to keep up the speed a little bit because we need about 25 more <laughs> items uh, to, in order to complete this build but um, yeah we need another 11 assemblers making processors and of course and we also have a couple of items that use the same resource so we can get a little bit more creative than just copy and pasting this all over 
for example like this with a neat little layout that covers both the circuit boards, the magnetic coils and the gears. As you've seen this several times before, these are each other's friends, but they come together nicely in a little layout in this specific build. And speaking of things that kind of nicely go together, we have the engines, turbines and supermagnetic coils. And of course those uh, normally would have a very complex thing where we have to leave things back on themselves or make a very stretched build so we can proliferate everything. But thanks to these bots, we simply bring them back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and proliferate everything on the same spot. So I am I once again just amazed by how tidy this makes our builds. And filling out the little gap we had over here in the corner, we have two assemblers making prisms. We're over halfway done, but we have some of the largest parts of the builds ahead of us. And the biggest part by far is the plane smelt. Well, actually, it's not the biggest part. It's very close to the biggest part because this recipe is horrible, as I've mentioned before. So we need a total of 17 of these. And again, I'm starting out with these, even though we don't have the inputs yet, just to get a feel for how large this area is going to be. And slightly smaller, but almost as large, we have the frame materials where we need 13 Mark III smelters in order to make those. Next up are two builds that actually need 11 assemblers each. And we have one for deuterium fuel rods and one for titanium glass. And the nice thing about these things is that they both need three inputs. So you can actually use an identical layout for both with one item going from the outside as well as on the other side kind of doubling up and then two items coming on the inside and an outgoing belt folding into the distributor similar like we've done up here for the frame materials and rounding out the last lane of the third section are the quantum ships where we need six assemblers and in our next section in our last section of assemblers at least i hope so we have our solar sails where we have seven assemblers making those now you might be thinking that I'm just placing these down in a random order and that's true to some extent uh, but there is a method to my madness. For example at the top I want to have something that only requires two inputs so I can have the third distributor uh, for the proliferators and again this is the largest thing that we need to build in this section so once again just to make sure I can fill it out nice and evenly. So it's not entirely random although I do have to admit at some point I just kind of fit the um, build in the order that makes sense in terms of what goes into what. For example, the next large thing are the Dyson Sphere components where we also need seven assemblers and the solar cells nicely go into that as a resource. So might as well just put them together. Next, we're going to need five assemblers in making Casimir crystals, four making titanium crystals, another four making photon combiners, and last but not least, we have four assemblers making rockets. Now, you'll notice that this is not actually working and that is because we're not quite done. But honestly, I don't know about you, but this is starting to look like a proper end game build. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how this finishes. But in order to actually finish this, we're going to need all our liquids. Luckily, thanks to the awesomeness that is the Mark II chemical plant, this is no longer the pain it used to be. So we have graphene and nanotubes being in production over here. And if you're wondering why this is all showing as a blueprint that I just put down, I actually moved the entire factory one line up just so I could actually fit this right here on the equator. So that means that we can actually uh, copy paste this entire build if we want to. Uh, on the second half of the equator down here. It should exactly fit, hopefully. Um, and by doing so, we make sure we make the most out of this space we have. Speaking of space that we have left, after we built the 13 chemical plants making graphene and the 10 making um, the nanotubes, we still need to make ourselves some organic crystal and plastic. And of course, we have some room over here. But last and definitely not least, we also need deuterium. And we are going to need quite a few particle colliders in order to do that. The plastic and organic crystals are pretty straightforward. We need three plants making the plastic and four making the organic crystals. And in order to make those, we're going to need to import some water and oil. I'm actually not going to be making the refined oil in this build because it's really annoying to do. At least I find it really annoying. I'd rather just have... Uh, for example, the mall planet where we have a refining station set up already that's producing way more than we need. Um, have that somewhere else, preferably like on the mall planet and just duplicate it there and then just import the oil from there 
because again I can't handle the <laughs> refining stations in my build it just gets so messy which leaves 21 particle colliders making the Turian because we need a hell of a lot of that stuff um, now actually that this needs slightly more than a full belt of hydrogen but as soon as you research uh, where is it the thing over here where there is an upgrade that allows you there you go to stack your logistics uh, cargo going out um, that will solve that issue so that is just one technology away which leaves us with this little gap in our build that we're actually going to put to use and there we go we have some distributors making sure that if we find any raw raw resources like the organic crystals hydrogen and deuterium two of which we already have access to of course thanks to our gas giants we also make sure we can use those rather than producing everything and i like doubling up on those because this production facility just makes sure that we always have enough production going um, so we don't bottleneck ourselves, but this part makes sure that if we do have those raw resources that we find in some places on, in the galaxy, we're also making use of those because otherwise they'll just sit there in inventory and not do anything. And now that we are producing rockets and solar sails, we only need something to actually transport those rockets up into the air and start working on our Dyson Sphere. Which is where this build comes in. We have real guns to shoot up our solar sails and we have silos in order to launch our missiles. And making sure you have a ring all around the planet like this is by far the most efficient way to get your Dyson Sphere going. Unless you have a tightly locked planet because in that case the planet doesn't actually rotate. So you can just fit them all on one side of the planet and keep shooting. Um, most planets do actually rotate though. So putting them around the pole make sure they have optimal vision of your Dyson Sphere. And uh, just go around and that's an easy way to do this. Now this is a little bit tedious to do uh, because especially with the rocket silos you actually need to transport the missiles into them rather than them getting in there through a sorter. Um, because this, this, well, the distance between the actual input port and the, the belt is too long. It's really annoying but anyway these splitters do the trick. And you only have to set this up once and then you can just copy paste it of course just or go all around your planet. Now I am proliferating both the solar sails as well as the rockets because that actually helps the launch speed um, which basically doubles up on the, the actual construction of your Dyson Sphere which is very well worth it. I'm also uh, distributing of course the um, actual uh, rockets as well as the solar sails to the ILS um, just to continue that trend but also for a very practical purpose because I am actually supplying these things um, currently they're not going anywhere. But if my Dyson Sphere is finished in one system, I can just leave the production on and these solar sails and rockets will be transported elsewhere and be used there. So this is just a practical purpose thing um, to make sure I'm not wasting any planets that I set up production on. Small note if you're using my blueprint for this build is that I won't actually set the outgoing solar sails and the rockets on the belts. There's a very good reason for that is that I prefer to set up my Dyson Sphere first before I start launching rockets and things like that into the air. Uh, and it is just more clean if you first set it up and then start launching, although it's more efficient to do it the other way around. But that's just me. But if you use my build, just make sure you actually put the solar sails on the belts. Same goes, of course, for the rockets over here. So when you start designing your Dyson Sphere, you'll find yourself with one orbit that you can delete, but you can add more and then add the others. And the general idea behind this is that you set your orbit, you set your radius, so this is how big it is. You determine in what direction it's, it's set. It doesn't really matter how you do that, but you can get creative with it with nice little layouts. And then all you need to do is basically set the color of the, the, the solar sails. And again, you, that doesn't really have a function other than making it look good. You can make rainbows and stuff like that. The more technical part is the Dyson Sphere itself, the Dyson Shell. Again, you can set the orbit bit. Uh, one thing to note about the orbit is that the larger you make it, the easier it is for planets to actually see the Dyson Sphere. Um, Although I wouldn't worry about that too much because if you make a very large one, it doesn't always look good. So if that's important to you, you might want to keep it smaller. Um, however, there's one benefit from having a planet inside the orbit. Because as you can see, I can't actually make the orbit this size because then the inner planet is going to be connecting with the Dysosphere. The game doesn't want you to do that, but you can make it bigger. So this would actually put my inner planet inside the Dysosphere, which gives every thing that connects from the planet to the Dyson Sphere, so in terms of power, um, rocket launchers, etc. 
a 100% uptime. So that is very efficient. Um, so it's completely up to you whether or not you want to do that. Um, don't worry, your Dyson Sphere is not going to affect your solar cells or anything like that. Uh, sorry, solar panels, I mean. Um, it's actually getting in the way of the sunlight doesn't actually have an in-game function. Just keep that in mind. Now, if you make a Dyson shell, you have a couple of different options uh, in terms of how to work with the layout. It just makes it convenient depending on what you want to design. Uh, I do recommend that if you start building it, you take one of these options and not, don't place single nodes. This is, will take you forever <laughs> if you build a Dyson sphere like that. And then you just pick whatever type of layout you like. There's different shapes that you can pick as well that will behave differently if you connect them to each other. So again, that just depends on how you want to design it. And don't forget to actually fill out the areas in your Dyson Sphere because this is where the solar cells will go. Now again, you can color this. So you can make it whatever color you want. You can color the different um, connecting parts as well. Uh, you can set those to different colors if that's what you want to do. Uh, you can design a giant Pac-Man if you want to do so. Uh, or you can just go to a, a Blueprint site like Dyson Sphere Blueprints.com that I'm using as well and copy paste a complete design into your game if you don't want to do it yourself. So again, that's completely up to you. I do recommend that you start small because if you make a giant sphere with a lot of nodes, a lot of connections and then maybe even multiple layers, as, as you can see, you can go completely nuts with the amount of layers. It will take forever for that sphere to actually be built, uh, which just means that you're going to be playing for hours and hours just looking at a half constructed Dyson sphere. Might not bother you, it's completely up to you, uh, but if you start with one or two layers, really small, and you actually get those built and then just expand on those as you go, um, at least you're looking at something that looks kind of done and constructed. But that's completely up to me, you do, uh, completely up to you, I mean, you do you. Now, as my first Dyson Sphere and Dyson Swarm starts to take shape, this brings us to the end of this episode. We have all these uh, rockets launching now at double speed, thanks to the proliferation. And this will actually make sure we can quickly start producing white science. I'll cover that in the next episode along with some tips and tricks on how to really bring your game to the end game until basically your PC starts melting and you can't take it any further. For now, I hope you enjoyed this build. I think it was a pretty nice and um, well, efficient as well as a good looking layout. And if you did enjoy it, make sure you like and subscribe. And you can become a member of this channel if you want to support me in some other way as well. Now, for now, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And I hope to catch you in the next one.